Good evening. My name is Bruce Knotts, and it's my pleasure and honor to direct the Unitarian Universalist Association office at the United Nations. Some years ago, it was suggested to us that we get UNFCCC status, uh, and that is, stands for the UN, Con UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so we pursued that, and we were able to get the status. And that allows us to send official delegations, official observer delegations to the conference of parties that are discussing climate change. And we've been doing that for several years now, uh, including the Paris Climate uh, Conference in 2015 and all the subsequent ones. We have a delegation ready to go uh, to Glasgow and we have two of the delegates here today uh, that, and this meeting will be about how we are going to uh, work to let our voices be heard and our influence be felt at this very crucial climate conference in Glasgow. Uh, we all have seen how climate change is already upon us. It is very destructive and it's likely to get much worse very quickly unless we take urgent action uh, to curb it. The Secretary General of the United Nations has called this code red. Uh, we are in a very serious position now, and we've got to get to work on this. And certainly we Unitarian Universalists will do our best to address this in the most effective and persuasive way we can. So I'm going to hand it over to one of our delegates, the Reverend Peggy Clark, who is the Senior Minister at Community Church of New York. Uh, I should also say that a Community Church of New York is uh, the first home of the UU office at the UN, and it continues to uh, afford us a great deal of hospitality, so we're very grateful uh, to UUs everywhere, but especially those at Community Church of New York, handing it over to Peggy. Thank you so much, Bruce, and it's really great to see all of you and to be with you here this evening. I was asked to start with a reading and a chalice lighting. So although I can't see a lot of your faces, I'm still gonna ask everyone if you would just take a deep breath with me. And let's try to just let go of whatever else was happening today and whatever else is happening in the world around us children and cats and dogs and spouses and whatever traffic, whatever it is that you're hearing, let's just breathe and be together. My reading this evening is from Greta Thunberg, whose um, clarity is just powerful and really gorgeous. This is what she had to say. Our house is on fire. We are facing a disaster of unspoken sufferings for enormous amounts of people. And now is not the time to, for speaking politely or focusing on what we can or cannot say. Now is the time to speak clearly. You say nothing in life is black or white, but that's a lie, a dangerous lie. Either we prevent 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming or we don't. Either we avoid setting off that irreversible chain reaction beyond human control or we don't. Either we choose to go on as a civilization or we don't. This is as clear as it gets. There are no gray areas when it comes to survival. Adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day, and then I want you to act. I want you to act like your house is on fire because it is. And so with that sense of urgency, with a feeling of absolute necessity, with the clarity of someone still considered a child, we are going to start our conversation by lighting our chalice.
the flame of our heritage. May this flame be the light that brings us on our way. It's good to be with all of you today. Thank you. And our next speaker is Doris Marlin. Uh, she is the leader of our delegation to Glasgow. And uh, she also is very much responsible, together with a lot of other people, but for the action of immediate witness in 2015, which really put the UUA on the right course to deal with climate change and climate justice. And so I'm handing it over to Doris now. Thank you so much, Bruce and Peggy. Thank you for reinforcing my panic <laughs> and that sense of urgency and um, all of the things. I, I, I come to you from the uh, traditional lands of the Anacosta Nation from Washington, DC. And there is quite a bit going on related to all of this here in DC right now. Um, so welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, kind of multi multitask a little bit in that I am going to um, show you by through sharing my screen um, how to find a lot of the resources that we'll be talking about tonight, but also a lot of the information. Um, my, my initial purpose in, um, the, in, as part of this introduction is to um, essentially lay out um, a little bit about, of how the COP, Conference of Parties, works, um, why you use our attending and what we'll be doing there, what is our advocacy position, and what are some of the things that um, would be considered a successful outcome for COP26, and then lay a little bit of the groundwork explaining some of the terminology that will be relevant for when you break into the model UN groups. So am, am I sharing my screen, and are you looking at Ministry for the Earth webpage, great. So I, I direct you there and I do wanna say hello to Allie, although I, I believe she, she is not available for comment, but certainly Allie, our program director and Cindy, our executive director, if you're available to say hello from UU Ministry for the Earth, please hop on and do that. You can also say no thank you. Okay, moving Hello. on. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. We, do we... Hi, Doris. Uh, I'm the co-director of Programs and Partnerships. It's great to be here with you all. And Reverend Cindy Davidson is our board chair. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much. Okay, so here we are. We are um, you, you see the UU Ministry for Earth web page. And look at this. We have a COP26 banner and just click on it. And here you go. You use ground and connect for COP26 UN Climate Conference. So what are our UU, UUA advocacy priorities? Well, this particular conference of parties is very focused on finance, moving the money to the places and to the people who need it. Uh, that, so that's one of, <coughs> excuse me, the um, focuses of this particular conference of parties along with greater ambition. Now the word ambition is used a great deal. It's for increasing the ambition to reduce our global emissions, increasing the ambition to um, move money to those to to the developing countries from the developed nations, so ambition is used a lot along with the term ratcheting up ambition, 
as in if you can just get it to move up one notch, then it's easier to get it to the next notch and just keep it going. So you'll hear ratcheting up ambition in reference to the Green Climate Fund, where we are already behind in, in mobilizing $100 billion by the year 2020. We're only at about 80% of that goal, much more needed. So again, our focus um, is, as as a, the UUA delegation is to um, raise our voices so that developed countries fulfill their financial commitments. And one way to do that is through, in, through meeting our US fair share of the Green Climate Fund. Um, also um, raise awareness and attention and actually move towards a dedicated funding and operationalization of a loss and damage, um, uh, a loss and damage position and platform, and then of course the nationally determined contributions, which is another way of saying a country's com commitment to how much they're going to reduce their emissions in order to keep the planet as close or below 1.5 degrees of warming. So um, every year we are given a few positions for to send observers to COP26. Um, we, we have um, three slots. They are shared between two different weeks and um, you're able to meet some of the attendees. We've got um, Reverend Peggy's bio here, um, Daphne Wysham, she is a UU out of Washington, myself. And there are also quite a few um, observers that are representing countries where they, um, developing nations that are in, the um, crosshairs of climate change for no, um, it, through no fault of their own. And it is the UUA's commitment to ensure that the parties that um, are being damaged the most are able to have their voices raised at the COP26. So here is a summary. Actually, this is from what you see here now is from the British government. And essentially, what, what do we need to do at COP26? Well, we want to focus again on um, a mid, making sure that we do not exceed 1.5 degrees um, global warming. Um, but what we, the way we need to do that is to be very ambitious towards, meet, towards reducing our emissions by 50% by the year. Um, 2030. Otherwise, we will overshoot that mid-century goal. Um, more on that later. And again, that is one of the reasons why um, the Build Back Better is so important. Um, protect communities and natural habitats. Um, the if, Focusing on restoration and preserving those most vulnerable. I've already mentioned mobilizing finance and um, really working together to deliver the policies, the rules, the oversight, and the ambition, and accelerating all of that to um, um, have a successful um, com conference of parties. So um, we're, we, we will soon break into the um, the Model UN portion, there are a few terms that you'll hear over and over. One is transparency. Um, transparency was a um, provision of the agreement that was fairly well established two, two years ago in Poland. They, they were very happy with how that came out. What does transparency do? It allows us to make sure that what all of the um, steps that are being taken are comparable, apples to apples. The way you're achieving your emissions is legitimate, measurable, just like the way my, my country is achieving our um, emissions reductions. But there will be a special emphasis at this COP on finance transparency. That will be critically important 
We are hoping that those rules will be established and in place starting 2024. Um, I've touched on finance and the Green Climate Fund, touched on loss and damage. One thing to note about loss and damage is that it's not exactly the same as um, moving money from developed countries to developing countries. It's actually compensation for the damage that the emitting countries have already done to non-emitting countries. Um, carbon markets, you'll hear references to Article 6, carbon markets, um, because in um, uh, Poland two years ago, that, those, that portion of the rule book did not get settled. What's the problem with that? Well, that means that when, say, the U.S., is saying, well, we want credit for reducing X emissions because we are purchasing um, the prevention of deforestation in another country um, that we can't double count it. And um, so that those rules um, are still not finished and there is some concern that we might not even get them finished at this COP. Um, I've mentioned ambition. Um, and the NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution Stock Take. Um, the first stock take was in 2015 in Paris when everybody put forth their emissions reductions, which will only get us to 2.7 degrees Celsius of warming, and that's optimistic. It's been more than five years. It's time for our next stock take and furthering the rules of our NDC stock take with our goals to stay below um, 1.5 degrees. With that, um, I've introduced you to a couple of terms. When we break into our model UN session, which Bill is about to kick off, keep, keep those terms in mind and how the countries that you will be um, studying in the positions that you'll be looking at um, might, um, their, how their positions might be regarding some of those terms. Thank you very much. Passing it over to Bill. Thank you, Doris. I did want to make a note of something which you had on the slide showing on the share screen that's showing now. That is, we will be having a daily discussion at the, of the COP during the meeting itself, starting on November 2nd. And it's down toward, yeah, there you go. And there is a link which I put in the chat, which you can register for this daily discussion. I'm going to turn now to a presentation on the uh, Paris Agreement and how it works in negotiations. And Allison, can you start the screen share for that, please? Uh, that's one of the later slides. Could you go to the first slide, please? There we go. Thank you. So this presentation is online, if you like, and uh, we can put a link to it. So uh, let's go to the next slide. There's a history in which the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the COP fit. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was founded in 1988, made its first assessment report in 1990. And that led to the Rio summit when the convention was agreed. And it was signed at that time by George H.W. Bush and approved by the Senate. And I always make this little note, Mitch McConnell was in the Senate at that time, so he proved it. It was a unanimous vote. But in 1997, during the negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol, the bird hegel resolution put the Senate on record against the protocol. And so that was never submitted to the Senate for ratification. And then in 2001, it was repudiated by George W. Bush. Then 2015, I'm skipping all the time in between, the Paris Agreement was signed. 
but it was not submitted for ratification by the Senate. It was a, an administrative agreement and then enabled President, former President Trump to renege on it in 2017. But President Biden has now re-established the US as a member, as a party. Next slide. So this is text from the Paris Agreement and it's a little hard to read sometimes, but I want you to get some of the very basic points that are in the agreement. And then I'll put a link in the chat for you to read the entire agreement if you like. The first is the idea of peaking greenhouse emissions as soon as possible to reach what's called net zero by 2050. The way that the language reads is a balance between anthropogenic emissions by surfaces and removals by sinks by in the second half of the century. But essentially you can call that net zero by 2050. And then the well-known figures, two degrees and one and a half degrees. And this one and a half degree figure was negotiated by one of the groups that was very influential in the Paris negotiations called AOSIS, which is an acronym for Association of Small Island States. And they're the ones that are gonna be flooded and disappear under the surface of the ocean if we go up above 1.5 degrees. So that's why they insisted on putting 1.5 in the agreement. Next slide. This is where we are now. If you look at the top line, that's what's going on right now. The next two lines down indicate some of the things that might occur with our current pledges if they're not strengthened. And the bottom lines indicate getting to net zero. The one at the very bottom is the one that gets us to net zero by 2050, which is of course the pledge of the Paris Agreement. But even if we do increase our ambitions considerably, we will still not reach net zero until 2100. So you can see how big the task is for us now. Next slide. Paris uh, has something called nationally developed uh, determined contributions, sorry, nationally determined contributions, which Doris already mentioned. <clears throat> They're expected to get stronger over time. Uh, progression over time is the way that Paris Agreement puts it. And each party shall communicate and maintain these nationally determined contributions. And they should be a progression beyond the previous ones. In other words, they should have higher ambition. So you can see how the Paris language treats the question of NDCs. Next slide. And this is the five-year review idea. Every five years, the parties meet to uh, discuss each other's nationally determined contributions and how much more they can do. And this requires them to develop strategies. Next slide. Now, when I was involved with the State Department as a Foreign Service Officer, we had interagency meetings to set criteria for negotiators going to the COPS. One of these criteria, for example, is 52% reduction of US emissions by 2030. That's a pledge that was made by President Biden after a lot of interagency meetings among the State Department, the Energy Department, Commerce Department, EPA, and even the Defense Department got involved because they do on national security, a lot of work on climate. Then the negotiators attend four or five meetings during the year previous to the COP. And for example, before the Paris Agreement, there were five meetings of the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Durban platform for an action that led to the Paris Agreement. And those meetings have already been going on this year. And that helps narrow down the differences and speed up the process of negotiations. Then during the COP itself, negotiators will often meet in informal groups 
and work on the text. So for example, the AOSIS that I mentioned earlier during the Paris Agreement, they met together to push their demand for 1.5. And finally, then the negotiator will meet in plenary to decide the official text. Now we can't do all that today, but we will try to simulate some of it. <laughs> and this is just an example or a portrait of what the COP is. It's 191 parties getting together in a city by invitation of a host country. The schedule is two weeks, <clears throat> starting with the high level segment, which is scheduled for October 31st to November 2nd this year. Then subsidiary bodies, there are two subsidiary bodies that meet during the COP. As a SEBSA is the subsidiary body for science and technology advice, and SBI is the subsidiary body for implementation. So they report to the COP and they convey things like the IPCC report to the COP for negotiations. And the most important negotiation sessions are usually in the second week. I've already mentioned the ad hoc working groups. So I won't go to that. Now the conclusion may be on the 14th day, which is actually November 13th, but sometimes they're extended by a marathon session lasting 24 hours or more. That, that's happened a number of the past. So we expect that COP will go to probably November 14th. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, Allison. So what we're gonna to do today is a model UN exercise. Allison is gonna have breakout rooms by region. Some of you have already signed up for the region and others will be signed, assigned sort of randomly. During your breakout session, you should choose a spokesperson and then that spokesperson should uh, sort of chair the meeting and get two priorities from a list that is finance, loss and damage, transparency, carbon markets, NDC stock take and ambition. Then decide what to defend or question and return to the plenary to defend your priorities. I think that's coming up later if I read the schedule correctly. So we'll do that. Oh no, it's coming up right now. So. We're on, right now we're having the breakout triads just for questions and comments, okay? Basically, you choose a spokesperson and volunteers will be welcome. If you wanna jump right in, then choose two out of the six priorities. And it should be, according to what you read in the notes on the climate summit in April. So just as an example, in Africa, most countries mentioned finance as one of the main issues. In Southeast Asia, it was loss and damage and so on. I don't trying to predetermine pre your choice, but that's the way you would look at it. Then you decide, what to defend or to question. If you want to question one of the other priorities, like the stock take, you can do that. And then return to the plenary to defend those priorities. So what I'm going to do is I'll put these uh, points in the chat so you can refer back to them while you're in the breakout groups. I have a question, please. Um, yes, go ahead, Nasreen. Uh, what does NDC stands for? I'm sorry, I was a few minutes late if you explained it. Um, no problem. That is an easy term to not be able to follow. So NDC stands for Nationally Determined Contribution. And the contribution is actually, um, it's actually not a contribution, it's what you're pulling back. It's how your country is going to reduce 
your carbon emissions. So it's the opposite of a contribution. <laughs> Nationally determined is kind of an emphasis on how we are, the, the uh, co conference of parties is not telling the, the parties what their emissions reductions should be they are determining that nationally. So nationally determined contributions is what, you know, in, in kind of uh, oversimplifying, it's what your emissions reductions will be. And when you hear the stock take referenced, which is a term that's used all the time in reference to um, the COP proceedings, it means that they are counting how much the reduction collectively will be, as in, if everybody's going to reduce by 10%, that translates into so many tons of carbon, which translates into so much less global warming. So that, thank you. You're very, you're very welcome. And then um, I see a question about ambition. Am ambition is essentially, um, well, you know, it, let it, let me share a slide that I think will help here, if that's okay. Um, and put up this. So it's kind of sort of normal. This slide. Um, a lot of people wonder where do all the countries stand as far as their nationally determined contributions. Um, I, I recognize this is a little hard to see, but maybe you can see enough. This is something where you can you can find out who is who is whose ambition for their nationally determined contributions is compatible with 1.5 degrees, um, uh, keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees. Well, only Gambia. Almost sufficient, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, Kenya, Morocco, Nepal, Nigeria, United Kingdom. Oh, that's good to hear about United Kingdom. Insufficient, USA, all the way down to the bottom. Um, I, I don't know if you're able to see some of the rest of the countries. But when we do a stock take, um, we're able to, be, because of that transparency that, that I mentioned and measuring apples to apples and following the measurements and putting them into Climate Tracker, we're able to see, in, in other words, do a stock take of how close we collectively are getting to the Paris Climate Agreement goals. Um, all right, any, let's see what else was in there. So ambition is do better on emissions reduction, do better on increasing your financing from the developed countries to the developing countries. Um, the carbon markets, article six, um, that is determining the rules so that you can't double count or miscount carbon trades as in, if the U.S. pays someone, some other country, uh, a fee to not burn their forests, the U.S. wants to take credit for those reduced emissions. And the 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 way that is currently accounted for um, is very problematic. And so that's what we're we need to set up a rule book or, or tighter rules around so that they can be counted more accurately. Okay, back to you, Bill. I put in the chat a link to the page where your country, the country you might have chosen to participate in the Model UN, stated its position. It's the second one there. The first one's got too many items in it. So if you don't know where your, what your country said in April this year about their ambition, click on that second link there. I think we're ready to do the breakout rooms now. Allison, if we could do that.
Okay, I think we're all set to go back to our plenary. And we have, I believe, seven regions to report. And I think we'll just take them in alphabetical order, if that's agreeable to everybody. Could we have a report from the Africa region, please? That would represent it. Oh, go ahead. All right, so from the uh, African parties, uh, we really want to strongly um, stress the need for finance and loss and damage, and particularly uh, from the fact that we haven't really, uh, many of the parties have not contributed to the um, global carbon emissions um, in, in significant ways. And then in fact, particularly in a country like Nigeria, uh, where, um, there is actually um, a good amount of oil, but we are really can't look into that or develop it as much as we would like to, because that is not in, um, a, does not meet with the Paris Accords. Uh, and so we are in this state of unable to develop financially and even contribute um, to these climate uh, efforts um, because we have not had the chance to uh, profit off of big oil um, and other fossil fuels as other countries. And so finance and loss and damage is really important because um, other countries do need to pay um, their fair shares. It would even be said, um, a representative from, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Congo, or um, one of the countries was uh, mentioned reparations, it is a form of reparations to, um, to uh, for developed countries, the global north, to uh, uh, put into the Green Climate Fund and to assist all um, the Global South developing countries in um, uh, all these, in the climate efforts into meeting the Paris Accords and, and reducing to 1.5 degrees. Uh, we also mentioned the, the abilities to uh, look at our agriculture systems and um, shifting how food is done. And so that maybe that afforestation can take place. Um, some countries in, in Africa, we are already starting with afforestation and planting new forests, um, and there are many developed countries that could shift their, all the land that's used for agriculture that we could, if we moved away from meat-based uh, production, we could actually create more forests, and that would be a significant way to limit emissions. That's something that we uh, think should be just highlighted a little bit. And loss and damage, the, uh, the point that um, there is, as I mentioned before, there are many uh, uh, countries that have, such as Kenya, that emit almost none. That's why we are on that list. Many countries are on that uh, almost sufficient list of countries when it comes to our, our climate tracking uh, because of the lack of emissions that we have and are doing today. And so um, we really want to stress um, this financial and loss of damage. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Next is Europe. Do we have a spokesperson for Europe? Please come yes. forward. Um, Good. I'm the, I was designated as the spokesperson for Europe. I represent in Norway. Um, the issues that we believe that in Europe we need to deal with are transparency. Um, you know, we, we mostly say we're going to be meeting things. And the question is, are we actually going to be doing it? But we also have questions about other countries, whether what they say that they're going to do, are they actually going to do? So we think transparency is a major issue across uh, all the regions that are um, going to be represented. Um, we also think that finance because um, a country like Norway, a country like Russia, our, our economies are funded largely by oil and gas production. You don't think of that in other areas of Europe, but, but they are. But on the other hand, we're also fairly wealthy countries. So we are being asked, just like Africa just did, to pay compensation to areas that have, you know, over, over history uh, contributed less emissions to, to our problem. Uh, and our question is, are we being asked to simply raise 
the life, uh, the, 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 the economies of countries who are more subsistence oriented or in justifiable cases, are we paying for losses of things like Vanuatu and base islands that are gonna be wiped out by sea level rise? So our chief issue is both transparency uh, within Europe and transparency by countries outside of Europe. We wanna know what they're asking for. We wanna know what other countries want because our, our economies will be harmed by uh, changes as well as uh, the requests for us to finance parts of the rest of the world um, for loss and damage. Okay, thank you very much, that's good. Latin America. Who's the spokesperson? Latin Hello America. Hello everyone, that's me, I'm Alicia. And in our group, we had representation from Argentina, Jamaica, and Antigua and Barbuda. So we spoke quite a bit about small island developing states and the particular circumstances that they find themselves in. And we know that within the region, we are disproportionately affected by climate change and by climate disaster. And Argentina has been very vocal about the issue of finance and calling for debt swapping. So having countries, um, the debt holders actually cancel the debt in exchange for holding equity. And we were thinking about ways that that equity could actually be in the form of contributions to um, getting to net zero. And for Jamaica and Antigua and Barbuda in particular, who have experienced so many uh, different uh, disasters along with sister countries like Dom Dom Dominica, the Bahamas and Haiti, um, it's really important to recognize the issue of finance here again and that so much of it is in the form of loans. These countries are saddled with debt on top of debt going way back to the 80s from the structural adjustment program. So there's a constant um, pile on of debt and trying to pay it down instead of focusing on adaptation and mitigation. So the finance piece of this is really important. And we also want to think creatively about ambition and how we can inspire other countries to do more to increase their commitments, looking at the carbon markets and also looking at NDCs, understanding that you know, just financing isn't enough. We actually have to look at our practices in countries, look at what nations are producing, how they're producing them and making shifts um, in the ways that we are providing energy and ensuring that we're going for more sustainable methods and that nations are prepared to be transparent about the changes that they're making and the impact that it's having on the overall effect and the goals that we've set at COP. Thank you, that's really good, thank you. Middle East. Bill, Bill excuse me, okay. and Alicia, I, be, please, I apologize. Alicia is one of our observers um, from, the, from uh, the UUA who will also be in Glasgow. I did not realize that you had been able to join us. So my sincere apologies that I did not recognize you up front. Alicia, welcome and thank no you. No problem at all. For, I'm happy to you. be able to join. <laughs> thank you for your very thorough exp explanation. Could could you just tell us a little bit about the organization that you're with and and what what like just a, a, sh a br briefly what what your goal for for participating at at COP will be? And Bill, forgive me, but I think this is totally important to make sure we recognize Alicia. Absolutely. Um, so I am based in the Bahamas and I run Equality Bahamas, which promotes women's rights as human rights. And we found that over the years since we formed in 2014, our work has sort of just expanded more and more and more over time. We started with a focus on ending domestic violence, expanded to look at gender-based violence and discrimination. We started looking at legal reform and just with the hurricanes that we've been facing year after year, and in particular, the Superstorm Category 5 Hurricane Dorian that struck in 2019 and pretty much wiped out two of our islands, displacing thousands of people. Mm -hmm. We recognize that we actually need to um, integrate climate work into our work of, on human rights because the two are interconnected. And it's an area that we hadn't looked at before. We didn't really have expertise in it. But following Dorian, we, with the support of UUSC, were able to 
um, offer relief. We did six months of hurricane relief, providing food, um, clothing, hygiene items, and a range of other things for six months um, for a couple hundred families that were displaced from Abaco and Grand Bahama living in New Providence, which is the main island, and trying to help them to rebuild and to be able to get back home because the, the family islands, as we call them, are so much nicer, so much quieter, slower pace. So being here where everything is centralized is it's almost a culture shock for people who are used to the quieter way of life. So we're doing our best to accommodate them. And you know, our, our goal at COP26 is to hold our own government accountable, to listen to what they're saying, to ensure that they're making um, a strong case for support uh, along with other Caribbean countries that have admittedly been a lot better at this than we have. Um, and also to connect with other organizations that are doing similar work and to learn from them. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thank, thank you. Let me let me jump in here just a bit. Sure, go ahead, uh, Bill. <clears throat> in my opening remarks, I talked about us having this uh, ability to send uh, delegates to the conferences. So yes, we do have that ability. But this was a collaborative effort. The delegation that we're sending is a collaborative effort between our office at the UN, the UUA office at the UN. UUSC, Salote Soko, primarily she and I have been on this uh, uh, topic for quite some time, putting together a delegation. Alicia is an implementing partner with UUSC, as she mentioned. Uh, so that's been, and we've also worked very closely with UUMFE. So it's, it's not entirely correct to say this is a UUA delegation. It's a collaboration of the UUA, UUSC, and the UUMFE. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, that's a good point. And we've got to remember that climate justice and other forms of justice are very much interrelated. Well, may uh, I chime in here as the other sure. uh, uh, observer? I'm attending on behalf of the Canadian Unitarians for Social Justice. And uh, as you know, Canada is the world leader in per capita emissions and um, is building pipelines across the Rocky Mountains to uh, sell oil and uh, gas to other countries. So um, we, I have a lot of work to do uh, with my Canadian colleagues to uh, sort of put the feet of the uh, Canadian delegation to, <laughs> to hold them to the fire uh, behind the scenes. Um, yes, I look forward to, to speaking with the other delegates as well during the conference. And Adi is joining us from Finland, where it's three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's right. So I may sound a bit rough. Sorry. <laughs> you sound fine. Middle East. Did we get anybody from Middle East yet? Um, I so. Oh, there yeah, we are. Good. I, I'm, I'm the uh, spokesperson for Middle East. Um, so right now, Middle Eastern countries, we want, um, we basically want um, economic concessions and technology to help with the transition, especially since a lot of our economies are based um, so heavily on oil production. We need to, um, if we're going to transition out of oil, oil and carbon economies, we need to have technological and economic concessions. And we want, um, we want transparency about international diplomacy and trade deals and how um, and if um, if there are going to be climate, if there's going to be adjustments to climates and, and treaty stipulations, we want to have, want to know exactly what other countries want from us and what they are going to do about issues. Oh, thank you very much. That's good. North America. Do we have a spokesperson for North America? Yes, Jean. Okay. I'm getting Very myself nice. organized. I'm. I don't know where I am, Nancy. Huh? Oh dear. You are the speaker, Jean. I know. I've lost you. We can Jean, see. We can hear you. We can, we can see you, we can, we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. I've, I've found myself. 
<laughs> I'm not sure what's going on here. There we are. So sorry about that. Are we on now? Are we good? Yes, you're good. Go ahead. All right, I'm so you, sorry. You've about been that. on for some time. I know. I've lost. I lost you. I couldn't find me. I couldn't find myself. Um, the group that I taught with a, in our group, we talked about things about finances and ambition. We focused primarily on because Canadian U.S. kind of approach here. Uh, and having some feeling some heavy responsibility around that. <laughs> uh, we talked about reducing emissions for sure. And uh, talked about reducing subsidies to the fossil fuel industries and to, redu and to redirect those, uh, those subsidies toward the development of alternative sources of energy, whether it be wind or solar or whatever is coming down the pipe. Uh, and then we talked about, we also expanded that to, in to include coal mining with the with the understanding that there's a lot of pressure from the coal countries uh, being placed at uh, people at the at the conference uh, in support of their own uh, their own interests, and the only thing I would add to that is that I'm thinking my thinking is that if if <laughs> if if the developed countries could find some alternative resources here and put some investment in it, they can share those resources with other countries. So they wouldn't be as, and make it more available and cheaper to produce so that they wouldn't be as inclined to use the traditional fossil fuels that the rest of us have relied on so heavily. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We, uh, for North Asia, I'll be the spokesperson. China, Japan, and Korea discussed finance because as more advanced countries, we are in a position to do more finance, and particularly Japan is working with a number of African countries, and China has a new green belt in rust, and uh, it's now, that is, China is now saying it will no longer finance coal power plants outside of China. We do not have ambition as high as the IPCC report is uh, considered important. For example, Japan has said 44% decrease in emissions by 2030, which falls below the 50%. And China is just saying, we'll peak our emissions by 2030 and then uh, reach net zero by 2050. So we, we need to work on the ambition part of our priorities. I think 2060 was the figure. 2060, right? yeah, sorry, 2060. Yeah. South Asia. We have a spokesperson. I'll for South Asia. Uh, South Asia is interesting because it includes developed countries like Australia and New Zealand, and it also includes the associated, the Association of Small Island States, uh, hundreds of islands in the Pacific that are perhaps the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, in our group, Marshall Islands is perhaps the prime example of a, of a country that is exceedingly vulnerable. It's one meter above sea level. It's, it's, it's a group of uh, Pacific atolls with no height at all. And clearly uh, the ASIS efforts to set the target of 1.5 Celsius is essential for the survival of the small island states. So we picked as our priorities, the loss, uh, loss and damage, uh, finance and ambition. Finance and ambition for Australia and New Zealand because we think they need to do a much better job of upgrading their, uh, their uh, ND up, NDCs and uh, also, uh, they, they're, some of their goals seem a little bit ambitious uh, compared to their plans. Uh, and also because we think they have an obligation to contribute to the financing to pay for the damage that has been done by climate change through greenhouse gas emissions in the developed world to the small island states. And so we think they have an obligation of finance uh, to those states uh, in, in President Kabu of the Marshall Islands has said that uh, he hopes that 50% of the financing can go to adaptability. 
and uh, what how you make adaptability work in a small atoll. I was in the Marshall Islands and it, there are places in the capital of Majorol where you can see the Pacific Ocean by looking to your left or looking to your right. The, the islands are that small. So uh, adaptability might well include migration, the ability to help people resettle in other places uh, if uh, the sea level continues to rise as it has. And that there's already evidence of damage, of loss of, of scarce agricultural uh, capability in, in many of these islands. Uh, the U.S. has a special obligation in the South Pacific because uh, the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. administered the United Nations trusteeship of the Pacific Islands of Micronesia and didn't do a terribly good job uh, in, in doing so. But we certainly had, we took on that responsibility for the United Nations, and I think we have a continuing responsibility to address the effects of climate change in these small islands there's some 2,000 islands in Micronesia um, uh, uh, spread out in an area that's larger than the geographic uh, size of the United States. Uh, so I think the U.S. also has a special responsibility to the Marshalls because we tested our hydrogen bombs in, in Iwetak and Bikini. And uh, I think we owe the Marshallese quite a bit for the damages that were done as a result of the radiation in the Marshall. Wait, wait, Don, I, I'm going to have to interrupt you because we're running out of time. But uh, if you have any specific report on the priorities from the South Pacific itself, not from what the U.S. has been doing. <laughs> yeah, well, the, well, the South Pacific, the uh, Kabua says he'd like to have 50 percent of the financing, as I said, uh, uh, used for adaptability purposes and how you how you use that in, in the small islands is the is a challenge. Um, and we think there are opportunities for solar and wind development in these islands. Uh, they could be very self-sufficient from an energy standpoint with the uh, support of the financing of a larger country. So those are some oh. of the issues. Okay, I think we're out of time. Did anyone do South Asia? I was. South Pacific. Okay, go ahead. So, um, there's no uh, doubt from the Indian perspective that climate change is real. We spent $87 billion on uh, climate-related um, uh, disaster relief in this country. And, and uh, Bangladesh uh, has even had a greater share of its gross uh, domestic product to uh, relief. The problem here is that um, in India, uh, the, um, the carbon footprint is only 60% of the global average. We have a, in India, it's a country of, uh, with, with people trying to uh, come up to the level of the global middle class. For rich countries, Europe and North America and China, uh, to say that we have to spend uh, as much money as it would take to, to mitigate climate change is asking us to roll back our plans to develop into the middle class. And it's, it's coming to us from a platform of wealthy privilege. It's time for the world to help India and to finance uh, uh, our, our, our transition to renewable. We have put money into... Uh, solar energy. We have put money into reforestation, but we can't do it. We just are unable. We have civil uh, unrest in our country. Uh, and I'm speaking uh, from uh, as a representative of a country I don't live in. But uh, no, we know. So uh, ultimately, uh, uh, at 60% of the global average for the footprint, we are already where other countries aspire to be. And, uh, but we need energy to come to, to a global middle class and the solar hasn't done it. We're using coal, yes, and we're using natural gas. And if we can have enough solar and, and wind and other technologies, that's fine. But right now, th there are so many people that are using uh, wood burning stoves and cutting down the forest. So uh, if, if you want India on board, you're gonna have to help uh, fund that uh, with, uh, uh, and I, I know that we don't have an ambition. We don't have a, a third, a uh, 2030 
um, goal yet. We really can't. We're not. We're not in a position to do that. It, if if you want India on board, uh, you're going to have to help us out financially. That's the way. Well stated, going. Mike. Very well stated. Thank you. Did not, anyone do Southeast Asia? Do we have a spokesperson? Um, Lo Lorelei and I were in the Southeast Asia group and we, we kind of um, went on to different topics. Um, and L Lorelei, was, was there a discussion that you'd like to share prior to when I joined? I, I will say um, Southeast Asia, of course, would also be highly interested in the finance finance and the availability of technology transfer. Thank you, oh, Doris. Southeast Asia posted in the chat. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, you've all done a great job of grappling with some of the issues that are going to come up next week and the following week. This is really a very satisfying exercise for me anyway, hearing from everybody talking about these issues. I'm so glad that you did work on that. Uh, we're a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna transfer it back to Doris, which uh, to help conclude the, the evening. Doris, can you go ahead? Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, so I, I um, have been frantically posting in the chat knowing that um, we, I have three minutes left and not the 15 I was kind of hoping for. Um, but that's okay because it was a rich discussion. Um, I feel like the main message I would like to leave everyone with is um, there are no such things as sacrifice zones. And um, sadly, I feel like I'm hearing more and more of that in the discussion as people um, and not in our discussion, but, but overall in discussion as people try to figure out what has to be done and how quickly and no, and everybody seems to think that, well, not everybody there, there's too much of an assumption that there are sacrifice zones. And that is the message I want to leave is we cannot let, um, the collective, um, allow for sacrifice zones. So is, is um, my slide up how to join a session? No. It's, it's not up? No. Okay, so let me, I'm sorry, I thought it was up there. While well, she's doing okay. that, I put in the chat a link to um, registration for daily discussions during the COP. I'll be holding those discussions every day at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1, 1 p.m. Pacific time. And if you register, you'll get a uh, Zoom link to join us. Also, the ENB, that's Earth Negotiations Bulletin reports, are available on a daily basis if you want to follow what's going on in the COP daily. And Doris will join us in the evening for her when we talk about what happened that day. Right. Now and, you got. And, uh, and all, yeah. yeah, all of that information either is or will be posted to that Ministry for Earth website that that I showed initially as this as this event opened. So I do want to point out that you can join and listen in virtually to not only the COP sessions but the press conferences. I find the press conferences the most fascinating. Those instructions will post to the, the Ministry for Earth website that Bill has shared and that um, is, is available. Um, so th this um, is kind of what, what the screen will look like. Um, several of you have already been on the uh, presentations that I've, I've given earlier this month. So I am going to mostly speed through um, what, what you've already heard before. But I do want to emphasize that um, it's because we are not getting everything we wanted for climate in the reconciliation bill. As a matter of fact, earlier before um, current events, um, it was estimated 
that as originally written, if both the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed and the Build Back Better Act passed, that could reduce green, our U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 45% over the next decade, which falls short of the 50% that we need. Given that we are not gonna get everything, the emphasis falls to cities and states. So your local action, your engagement at the local level becomes even more important. Um, I'm gonna breeze through this slide. Um, although I will point out that Norway right here, who that was mentioned by one of one of our presenters is in the insufficient category. So get, get going, Norway. Um, others, this, this indicates um, where every country is um, in relation to their gross national income and compared to how much they are contributing towards um, finance. Um, and you can see this green line is a country at the 80% level of their gross national income contribution. And the um, orange line is their gross mm -hmm. national income share all towards the $100 billion of climate finance that needs to be happening. The United States is way down here, well below um, our fair share of gross national income um, as a um, subset of what we need to be contributing. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. I mentioned that there will be a focus during this COP26 on enhanced transparency of finance. Um, I've used this slide before. I, so um, regarding the Green Climate Fund, because this 27%, uh, which is the U.S. historic emissions, is we, we have historically been the greatest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, it is really not in question that we should um, carry the, the heaviest load towards um, offsetting the damage happening to the developing nations. So just wanna point out that the Green Climate Fund is for, it is just one aspect of climate finance. There are many other avenues. It funds mitigation, which prevents additional greenhouse gases from going into the atmosphere and adaptation, which is to um, essentially make it possible to live with the ongoing damage that is happening. And it also includes technology transfer. You can't see the bottom of my slide, but technology transfer is essentially for um, energy, infrastructure, agriculture, water, health, resilience building. Um, I know we are out of time. I'm going to get to my closing slide. There is a link that was put in the chat that is also shown here that's also available on the Ministry for Earth website to write to your representatives, have them fund our fair share of the Green Climate Fund. Right now, I believe it's 1 billion point two is the proposal but we have yet to have Congress pass an appropriation to just even start scratching the surface of our fair share. The more they hear from you, the better. Um, there is also a great deal of information um, that is available on our UU Ministry for Earth website. Um, and um, uh, as well as numerous articles, um, quite a bit that um, is informative to help everybody come up to speed on just some, some of the things that are so critical. And of course, um, we always, as a faith group and as part of the faith contingent, will be emphasizing um, that um, we, we need to stand for the people who will be affected the worst, who have done the least to, um, to cause climate change. And that includes human rights as uh, I believe it was Alicia who, who tied the importance of human rights to um, climate change actions. 
as well as um, the loss and damage that is happening to those that have not contributed to it at all. Um, I know we're over time with that. I will close. Please do take advantage of all the information that is posted to the Ministry for Earth website. And I will put that in the chat again. This video, along with others, have, will be linked to that website, along with resources. And I believe we'll be sending out these links and um, just a, a summary of um, some of the messages that we're sharing tonight with everyone who has registered. It's been my pleasure to meet with you this evening. And I thank Bill and Allison and Bruce, Alicia, Peg, Reverend Peggy, for all you've done so far. And, and we'll be doing, we do have a closing from Reverend Peggy. I know that we're out of time, so I'm not going to do a, a closing, but I will just, extinguish our chalice, sending our light out into the world. Thank you all so much for being here and for putting this together.